My name is Anne Dillon. I'm a dental nurse assistant in London, England. My age is 17, and I have had five months' experience in dental work since leaving school. I live in a small village called Bulls Green in Hertfordshire. This is our house. It is over 400 years old. It takes me an hour and 20 minutes to reach the surgery. I like to allow about 20 minutes to have everything ready for first patient, usually due at 9 o'clock. First of all, as in housekeeping, it will be understood that no stock routine would be satisfactory for different houses. Our practice is by no means typical, and as you will see, some of our equipment is not new. But I shall try to show and describe the general pattern of the sort of work I do. For example, the many odd jobs which are done at the start of each day. Some people think one can just walk in at nine o'clock and greet the first patient. But this is not so if any sort of high standard is to be achieved. And if not, well, the job would lose interest. At least it would for me, as a slipshod practice will attract slipshod assistance, and ultimately slipshod work, which is bad for everyone concerned. Since I left last evening, the daily cleaner has done the general cleaning, but not, of course, the working parts of any of the equipment. In most surgeries, there are perhaps a dozen electrical checkpoints, apart from the many fuses which one should be able to locate and repair quickly when needed. Such spares as fuses and lamps should always be right to hand. One item which cannot be planned ahead is their sudden failure. There should never be any atmosphere of rush or bustle. Every patient, even the most exacting and inappreciative one, must feel that she is receiving the best possible care and attention. The only simple way to achieve this is to take the same individual interest in each patient. And interest is the key word right through. Without it, the job is twice as hard and is not done half as well. Spray bottles and the water reservoirs of turbine attachments need watching during busy sessions, as they may need additional replacement. One duty is to see that there are clean towels and that the surgeon always appears in a clean, uncreased coat. Also, any time a smudge is noticed, he is requested to change. In a busy practice, there is little time to look in the mirror. If any of the staff get any smudge or mark, or if hair is untidy, a slip showing, etc., one of the others immediately, but quietly, draws attention to it. The mixing of anaesthetic solutions and the maintenance of adequate supplies of drugs and oxygen are two most responsible tasks, carefully double-checked by the surgeon or a senior nurse until safe proficiency is achieved. I have not done this very often. One of the faults at first is not holding the needle firmly on the syringe when mixing. Spilling but a few drops of water when mixing will alter the strength of the solution. If dosage is gauged from previous records, this may well alter the depth and length of an anesthesia, if not conscientiously and accurately recorded. The preparation of any local injection is also subject to strict control. If the oxygen supply ran out during an anesthesia, the results may be even more serious. So the machine must be checked each morning. While it is well to realize the vital importance of such personal responsibility, this does not weigh too heavily after the first few cases, as the routine and its checking become automatic. All the record sheets for the day are ready in the file. These are checked in sequence with the appointment book, so that each is ready as required, together with any relevant x-rays or laboratory work. Everything is prepared in advance 
so that when the patient comes into surgery, there is no delay while any necessary data is being obtained. When the patient comes in, no instruments or models are in sight. Headrest pad, warm mirror, last minute check, and all is now ready for the first patient and the surgeon. The headrest is adjusted, either a short or long bib placed as required. a tissue for removing lipstick while the mouthwash is placed, a clean tissue for patient's use, water is ready in the basin. While the surgeon washes, he should be able to see the name and any special or personal notes about the patient, so that he is not only able to greet her by name, but also maybe to inquire about little Johnny's measles, or a special tooth which may have been treated recently. The treatment to be done this visit is clearly marked on the small slip attached to the record. Towel ready, adjust light, and always see that the light is not allowed to shine in the patient's eyes. If treatment is to be given, a long bib rather than a short bib. Though two assistants would normally be present, the next sequence shows the many tasks of the assistant who may be suddenly single-handed during any part of an anaesthetic case and should be able to carry on without the surgeon being delayed at all. This ability to take over at any moment is one of the most important parts of an assistant's training and the success of any operation under any type of general anaesthetic, whether given by a medical or a dental anaesthetist, depends in no small measure on the assistant's efficiency as a vital member of the team. Only two people are shown here for clarity. Usually we are more crowded, but the general principles of assisting are the same whatever the technique. A damp flange mouth pack, properly positioned, will prevent the finest particle of foreign matter being inhaled on the airstream. This is even more important since high-speed methods came into use. In anaesthetic assisting, the first duty of every member of the team is to keep an eye on the airway and respiration. During concentrated attention to some part of operating, the surgeon may inadvertently move the palatal part of the pack flange. If he does, the assistant stops him operating for the moment while it is repositioned. The mouth pack is changed as frequently as is necessary. Everything is aimed at saving time and motion for the surgeon and anaesthetic time for the patient. Throughout, you will notice that the hands of the surgeon seldom have to move more than a few inches away from the job and his eyes are seldom diverted from the work. For example, the zinc oxide dressing, which has been mixed at the beginning of the day and is kept at the right consistency in a silica gel bottle, is presented with the instruments within a few inches of the site of application. The action is simpler to show than to explain. In practice, the alloy would be mixed by a second assistant or be done right at the chair side, much faster than shown here. It is loaded into a number of carriers and the assistant can either place the amalgam into the cavity as directed or place the loaded carrier in the hand of the surgeon in such a way that he can use it in a single movement. It is not lavish equipment which saves time but careful pre-planning and being taught what is being done and why. One can then anticipate the next action. The engine mallet is being used here to condense the amalgam. You see now how the head of our volunteer patient 
is being supported during extractions. In the upper molar region, the surgical pressure is upwards and outwards. The assistant presses the head rather like a rugby ball, countering the sideways thrust. In the lower molar region, a rotational force must sometimes be applied, and to save this stress being fully transmitted to the articulation, this is protected as well as possible by firm support on both sides, countering the applied thrust. As soon as the surgeon has completed his work, the assistant must be responsible for the patient. Biting on a suitable peck will temporarily prevent the blood being swallowed while the patient walks to the recovery room. Clinical photography is often another small but interesting part of one's work. When selecting trays or holding impressions in place, one must bear in mind where the standing teeth are, and of course see that impressions go to the laboratory at once and with the necessary data. If forgotten, shades cannot be matched over the telephone. No patient should carry away with her the slightest visible sign of her session in the surgery. When giving appointments, the attention of the patient should be drawn to any necessary preoperative instructions. In cleaning surgery between patients, an automatic routine is followed. Ours is headrest pad, mouthwash, mirror, handpiece, records and instruments. Instruments will, of course, be clean before sterilizing. Then comes a general surgery check. The surgery must always look spotless, no matter what the previous operation may have been. Floor cleaning is not on the normal agenda, but if needed during the day, the only indignity attached to it is not doing it properly. As in general nursing, there is always cleaning to do. One thing we do deplore is a messy basin. If everyone remembers to use the soap with dry or almost dry hands, keeping it out of the water, many hours of cleaning are saved in a year. A practical routine halves the work compared with a laborious approach, which would also be more tiring. Though one sees surgery sterilizing here, and instruments being placed back in their correct places between patients, it may well be that as in our everyday custom, the sterilizing is done in a separate sterilizing room, and instruments refiled at any time during the work when it is convenient. Such a plan requires the use of more instruments than would be the simple method shown, but each is suitable for its particular purpose. One learns to cast models in emergency, here I am learning the hard way. As you may guess, this is the first time I have ever cast one. It is the best way to learn how careful one must be in handling models and other laboratory work. Trimming is much easier if the plaster is not left to get as hard as this. I thought I'd hate looking at teeth, but it becomes quite fascinating. If the appointment is for prosthetic, orthodontic or other work, all necessary models must be ready to hand. Charting is quite a game of skill. Sometimes when teeth have moved, our surgeon will chart a six as missing, then find a cavity in it, though one is not quite sure which is training and which an error. The x-ray machine is handled not with fear but with respect. One should never stand in front of the x-ray tube while it is working.
The developing of X-rays is a simple task once one realizes the necessity of careful time and temperature control with a plan for changing solutions. And no matter how quickly required, never skip the initial rinsing. Fixer marks cannot be removed from uniforms. We don't usually mount our X-rays, but merely list and file them, unless they are to be sent away. The file numbers of X-rays taken also reminds one to change the developer solution in good time. Such filing and other equipment maintenance jobs will often accumulate during busy periods and be done in order of urgency as soon as time allows. Broken appointments, cancellations or special time being allotted for maintenance. Here you see some of the essential maintenance jobs taking scratches out of spatulas and plastic filling instruments. Sharpening cutting edges. Always remove oil from slab afterwards. Amalgam carriers can often be freed by passing over a flame. In cleaning burrs, never scrub hard with a brass wire brush. If one strokes the burr over the tips without bending them, the job takes half the time and the brush lasts many times as long. Mercury or a solvent is used to remove alloy from diamonds which are always stood in small holders and never laid down on glass. For medium high speeds, 30,000 to 60,000 revolutions per minute, mechanical hand pieces need constant lubrication with special high speed oil or they will overheat. Slack bearings must be changed at once. Occasional dismantling for checking just takes a minute. Those items which should be autoclaved are packed in a drum and sent away for sterilization. Never try to keep up with the Joneses during duty hours. Let them try to keep up with you. Set a quiet standard which will pass in any company. Tidy hair, well-groomed hands, natural and clean nails. No slip showing, simple shoes. No obvious decoration or makeup. You may wear a full white rig and cap. This is merely our way. At the end of each day, the sterilizer is emptied and cleaned. Notes are made of any items to be replenished from stock. Record sheets are completed and the last oddments done so that one arrives at a fresh tidy surgery in the morning. When first starting this type of work, unless one has been used to hospital ward work, one feels quite exhausted with feet which seem to ache more each day for a week or two. Even afterwards, the work is sometimes tiring, always exacting, but never stale. It has endless variety and interest, and gives that special personal satisfaction of being a really worthwhile sort of job. I don't do all these jobs every day, of course, but I hope this has given you an idea of the type of work I have to do. I wouldn't change it for anything.